Now that brings me to introducing our panel host, Chanel Contos. Um, so for those of you who might need a reminder, um, after collecting a handful of testimonies on sexual assault from close friends in May 2020 and in February, so in February 21, Chanel started an online petition demanding for consent education reform in Australian schools. And she had called for other students to submit testimonies that detailed their experiences and how consent education could prevent this. And in two weeks, she gathered 6,000 uh, signatures um, on a shared Google Doc, which is now the movement Teachers Consent. Uh, Chanel is currently working closely with the Australian government at both state and federal levels, working towards educational reform and pushing for legislation change. Everyone, please make Chanel and Yumi and Melissa welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, hi everyone, I'm joining today from London, but I grew up in Sydney on Gadigal land. Um, so Yumi and Melissa, we have two amazing women here today who have inspired many and educated thousands um, over all of the work they've done in their careers, including publishing three books together. So I'm sure that they're very good friends and we're gonna have some nice synergy in the conversations we have today. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you both today. Thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone listening, we're gonna be covering off quite a few topics from consent to power, gender, peer pressure. But before we do that, um, I'm going to ask the experts to introduce themselves. So Yumi, it's lovely to see you again, virtually, unfortunately again, but one day we will meet in person. Thanks, Janelle. Um, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm Yumi Steins. Um, I'm the co-author of this book that I wrote with Dr. Melissa, who you'll meet in a sec. Um, it's called Welcome to Consent. Um, the book came out really while the storm about consent was taking place here in Australia. I speak on Gadigal land and acknowledge and pay respects to elders past and present. So in my work as a broadcaster on the podcast, Ladies We Need to Talk on radio, on KISS FM and through writing books with Dr. Melissa, I really feel like I unfurl a lot of issues pertaining to sexuality um, and health and this one in particular, consent. Thank you so much. And Melissa, I'm so glad you can join us today. As I said to you before, um, about 95% of my sex education and almost 100% of the valuable sex education I got came from reading Dolly Doctor. So if you want to <laughs> introduce us. Thanks so much, Chanel. And hello, everybody. I am also speaking to you from Gadigal land, where I'm fortunate enough to both live and work. I was writing, I was the doctor behind Dolly Doctor for 23 years. So in that sense, the longest running consultant to that column in the magazine. But Dolly Doctor, of course, was a, was a whole section and there were many, many contributors over those years. And even though it was a very small part of my working life, it, it really formed and transformed my conversations with young people, my, gave me so much insight into the way particularly young adolescents thought about the world, about sex, about consent, about all sorts of things, including their relationship with parents. I am a medical doctor and I still work in a youth health clinic one day a week and the rest of my week I am uh, an associate professor at the Sydney Medical School at the University of Sydney. Amazing. Thank you both so much. So um, let's start off with my favourite topic, which is consent. Um, and it's a word that means a lot in a lot of different contexts. So Melissa, I might throw to you first and just ask, what are the golden rules of consent? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a really important place to start because as I mentioned, I got to know a lot about how adolescents thought about consent. But when I've scanned through the thousands and thousands of questions that were sent into Dolly Doctor in the magazine, the word consent itself never really appeared. It's not like a young person wakes up one day when they're going through puberty and thinks, I want to learn about consent. It's something that we actually learn and absorb from the world around us, and particularly, I think, from our parents when we're younger. So consent is kind of simple in a way. It's, it's, it's permission. It's about giving permission. It's about an agreement to do something with another person. But when we when, when we're talking about consent around 
um, bodily contact around sexual interactions or, or those kinds of more sensitive and very personal in, intimate negotiations. I think it's really good to sort of ground ourselves in what the golden rules are. And in the book that Yumi and I wrote, we talk about six sort of main golden rules and the, they're not in any particular order because I think they're equally important, but consent must be voluntary. It must be voluntarily given. So that means you have to be conscious. Um, you have to be um, alert enough and lucid enough to be able to voluntarily give consent to whatever it is that you're doing. Consent has to be specific. So you might say yes to one particular behavior or one particular thing that you want to do with another person, but that doesn't mean yes to everything. And as we know, as we're growing up and going through adolescence, those kinds of intimate behaviors change an awful lot. So what you might consent to when you're, when you're uh, younger doesn't mean it's what you're going to consent to when you're older and vice versa, and it changes from day to day, from situation to situation. So it has to be specific. It also has to be communicated. So there needs to be a language or uh, a way of communicating that doesn't have to be verbal language. In fact, a lot of communication is nonverbal. So people have to find ways to both listen, to observe and to understand and to reflect back. It's an ongoing active process. And I guess that's that leads into the fourth golden rule, which that is that it's active and ongoing. Um, consent can also then change during the course of a particular event um, or a particular hour or a particular day. It can be withdrawn at any time. So it's really very, it's a very active process. And then finally, but not, not by any means least important, is it must be enthusiastic. And um, by that, it doesn't necessarily mean you're jumping up and down and, and shouting, but it does mean that, that you have to be um, confident enough and enthusiastic enough that this is what you're agreeing to do, knowing that you can change your mind. So that's a, a very brief summary of the golden rules. Um, within all of that, of course, we need to consider power, and we'll be talking about that, I think, um, as we progress through this through this webinar, um, power and understanding power relationships are critical, particularly when you're a young person. We'll definitely get to power in one moment, but just before we do that, I want to throw to Yumi and ask, when we're talking about consent, specifically between kind of children and adults, whether that's parents or teachers or whoever it is, what do we need to think about in terms of these interactions and teachings when it's coming from um, the people in our life who are role models? Mm. Well, I thought a lot about this, um, Chanel, in the lead up to this chat and also during the writing of the book. And I do wanna take this opportunity to thank everybody who's watching. Um, it's so great to have you and you're so appreciated for being here. What you hear today, I hope really sticks in your brain, at least some bits of it. And you can use tools that we give you during this conversation, particularly the parents um, and particularly uh, any teens or tweens who are watching. Um, we really, really think you're cool for being here. So it's tricky, right? Um, and as a parent, it's an ongoing thing. So I think particularly thinking about it from a parent's perspective is quite useful. Um, for instance, if you say to your kid, hey, can I tell your hair dry, it's wet? And they're like, no. You, and then you pin them to the ground and you put your, the towel in their hair and you shake it all through, then you're clearly teaching them that their consent or their withholding of consent didn't matter to you in that moment and that your need to see their hair dry overrode your respect for their consent. So as a parent, that's a quite confronting idea, but their hair's wet, they might get cold. I care about them, it's all from love. And, and that's, that's so good to sit with and, and to internalize because when it's a sexual thing or a physical intimacy thing, that's often from love and desire as well. It's a warm feeling, it's not aggressive, it's not hostile, and it's certainly not trying to hurt anybody, but that might not be what the other person wants. So to sit with those feelings, particularly in that safe place where you love your child and your child loves you, you can unpack ideas of consent. You can see where maybe as a parent, you might've failed but you can do better next time. And you can also talk to the, the kid where they feel safe 
understood, they're able to ask questions, and perhaps even have some practice in setting the boundary for themselves next time. So they could say to you, hey, I really didn't like that when you forced the towel into my hair. Um, don't do that again. And as the parent, there may be a future situation where your kid is walking around with wet hair, you have a perfectly good dry towel in your hands, and you have to suck that up. And that's a great lesson for everybody to learn. So in all of that, I think there's, there's just so much for parents and for kids and of course that's one example but it goes on and on with you know what do you want for dinner um can I kiss you please go and you know give your grandpa a hug or you know all kinds of ways in which we can think about is this the best message about consent and my child's bodily autonomy so one of the things that Dr Melissa and I try and explain is if you can imagine this it has an inviolable um, boundary around it, like a country has a border and you're actually the boss of this territory. So even a little kid who's like, I'm not the boss of anything, I'm the six years old, actually, guess what? You're the prime minister of this, right? And the kids, once they get that message, that's really a bit of a revelation. And in ways as they progress, you know, through childhood into adolescence, into getting periods of facial hair, that kind of thing, to understand actually you're the CEO of this business and you get to dictate what happens here. The more we bed that in as each change happens, as each step progresses, the better it is for the kids. It's a great example. Thank you so much, Yumi. And yeah, the importance of um, navigating those things with children. I know obviously I don't, I don't have a child, but I know that um, I've had conversations with some people who try to model and practice consent as much as they can as parents. And with those kind of essential things like brushing hair, drying hair, you know, brushing teeth. Um, they also offer their children options to be like, okay, would you like me to blow dry your hair today? Or would you like me to dry it with a towel? So they're still having body autonomy and choice over what they're doing. And they're still becoming confident to make decisions, but whatever option is chosen still gets the um, job done. So let's talk about power now because we can't have this conversation. I think it needs to be addressed early. I think it's, um, absolutely fundamental. So should we start with you, Dr. Melissa? Sure, thanks, Janelle. Um, oh, thank you, Yumi, for those wonderful illustrations. And power starts with the adult and the child, doesn't it? It starts with being a parent. And I'm a parent of four now adults, um, but certainly when they were growing up from infancy right through to their early adulthood, I did have power over them with every everything that I wanted them to do, every decision that got made. Um, so I think it's something that perhaps we're sort of aware of at some subliminal level, but we don't bring it to the forefront of our minds. So if we start thinking about the way we touch our babies and our toddlers and want to pick them up or want to give them a hug, um, I think there's there's obviously room for just intuition and, and it's the children that often come running to you. I still have these lovely memories of when all my four children were in the same primary school and every day when I went to pick them up, <clears throat> the four of them would come running up to me and give me a hug and it was lovely. I think we were kind of, um, a bit, we were thought of as a bit strange perhaps in the school playground, but, but I suppose um, we can start role modelling those um, and acknowledging that there is a power imbalance with our children by asking them if we can give them a hug or by offering them, as you said, Chanel, a choice between how they want their hair dried or what they want to wear <clears throat> or what they want to eat. Um, or if it's something that really they need to do, like, you know, they've got to hold your hand when they cross the road. We, we have a conversation with them explaining why this is so important or putting sunscreen on or wearing a hat or whatever it might be. Um, of course, as our children uh, go out in the world and go to school, there's huge power imbalances between them and their teachers, basically between them and any other adults in their lives. Mm. Once they get to adolescence and hit those very particularly early awkward um, stages of self-consciousness and wanting to fit in, wanting to belong, some of that power uh, happens in their, among their peers as well. So it's kind of that social hierarchy that you see, particularly in adolescence, like, you know, the whole Mean Girls movies and that sort of thing, where the people with social power might be the same age, might even be a bit younger than, than them. But there's nevertheless still this um, motivation, I guess, to 
to at least either be invisible or to to not be so uncool or to be cool um and and so just having those conversations with our children about those um tensions that they feel or those pressures that they feel to uh to conform to some kind of social power hierarchy is important <clears throat> um the other area i think where we're you know it's still very very prevalent even in 2022 is the power imbalance that's related to gender and I think I've seen over my career working with adolescents and doing research around sexuality and sex and certainly um, conversations I have with patients um, when they come to see me as a doctor I still see uh, I mean, there's a lot that has progressed, I think, in society, but I still basically see this baseline level of, of gender power imbalance among same aged peers, and certainly um, when there's an age difference as well. And I think that those kinds of changes in our attitudes around gender and power need to start happening before conception <laughs> or certainly from a, the youngest of ages is to really and we need to we need um you know we need fathers involved we need to teach this to boys as much as to girls I think for too long the discourse has been around teaching girls how to say no teaching girls how to stay safe teaching girls how to not get so drunk that you know they won't be able to um avoid some sort of breach of their um of their consent or some violation when really we need to be move, shifting that entire discourse onto um you know onto an equal platform with with boys and men as well and say look um you know really teaching them what consent means um so that's my sort of um quick thoughts on power I'm sure you mean if you like to add to that yeah, I think it's a really good place to start this conversation, Chanel, because power has so much impact on whether or not you can truly consent. Um, so given um, a situation where you might be uh, a, a young girl and your boyfriend or some guy who's, who's interested in you is two or three years older, those two or three years can have a significant effect on your sense of power and um, powerlessness. He might drive, he might have alcohol, he might have three or four friends in the same um, house where the party's happening um, and you feel very conscious of a, a certain helplessness that is a power imbalance. So in that situation, do you have the power to say, hey, I don't like this, I kind of think I want to go home? Or are you scared that something bad could happen, something worse than your consent being violated. Um, the way that our imaginations often work is to go to the worst case scenario, which is part of our need to survive. So if I say no, if I make him angry, is he going to beat me to a pulp? Am I safe? Um, so in situations where that power imbalance does put you at a huge disadvantage, you might consent to something that you really don't want to do so pointing that that out that that is a real life situation that really does happen to people is really crucial in conversations around consent so people can understand also oh, consent has to be enthusiastic and freely given that's what that kind of means if i'm if i'm saying yeah okay sure i'll go on that awful ride on the ghost train and then i'll sit around and watch horror movies for four hours Sure, that sounds great. And you're, you're tense and your body is saying no. Even if your words are saying yes, your consent isn't really enthusiastic. So understanding that, that things can work against you being truthful verbally, being truthful um, even to yourself um, is all part of being able to kind of step yourself through what consent really looks like in the wild. I'm so glad you brought this up, Yumi, because it's something that um, through reading those 6,700 testimonies that got submitted to teachersconsent.com, I got just like such a specific, like quite a unique insight into how these situations were happening on scale. And something that kept coming up time and time again was this idea of someone saying like, I was really confused about it for years because I wasn't explicitly forced into doing anything, but I didn't feel like I could say no so I just went with it or you know he kept asking so eventually I said yes and you know 
now hopefully young people are going to be more and more equipped with concepts of coercion and also um understanding different trauma responses to situations where there's power imbalances in there um so i feel like we should talk about that as well but i quickly want to talk about what you're describing there there's a word for it called fawning which is basically when you're being over nice and accommodating and going with the flow um because as you said our bodies work in funny ways and even though it's quite unlikely that you know the older cool boy from the nearby school is going to beat you to a pulp you don't know that so your body in that instance acts as if worst case scenario may happen um so just doing whatever to get out of the situation um but should we also talk about what doing things like you know freezing and stuff like that looks like in situations of danger peer pressure yeah um, I'd love to talk about that there's a few things that people got wrong about consent for a long time so one of them was no means no um which absolutely no does mean no and that was a way of saying listen if you're in a situation and you're hassling someone out for sex and they say no that's what they mean um, but I think that the misunderstanding existed in that um, people thought that therefore all yeses mean yes, or the absence of no means yes, which, which isn't true. Um, the other misconception that's, that still per pervades today around consent is fight or flight being the two physical responses that humans have to threat, which are absolutely true. Um, fight being the need to kind of defend yourself physically and tough, you know, sort of puff up and, and get fighty or flight, which is to flee the scene, to run away, to escape as quickly as possible. And those are two um, really natural responses to threat, but there are others. So freeze in a, in a um, sexual assault situation is a very common response. Um, and scientists liken it to animals playing dead. So you're, you're sort of so scared or you're so confused by what option to take that you actually take no option, which is to go to freeze. Um, and that, that is a really common thing that people experience in all situations of, of threat, um, not necessarily sexual threat um, and fawning, um, or it's sometimes called appease. So um, fight, flight, freeze, appease. Um, it's, which is where you're you, you're still um, being friendly and jovial and m making everything okay and doing the forced smile because you know that the best chance of survival is to keep everything peaceful and not escalate it um, by fighting back or, or, or creating an enemy. So you fawn or you appease, um, and and that um, I think is is starting to enter the understanding from people, for instance, in law enforcement, that just because she sent you a smiley face text after that incident doesn't mean she thought everything was okay. So don't take that as evidence. She's trying to stay alive at that point in time. Um, and, for, and what that means for people um, who are processing some sort of event is that they don't feel, they feel a bit more like, okay, that wasn't my fault. That's just what humans do. Exactly. And yeah, we definitely later in this conversation should talk on this idea of it's not your fault and help seeking um, no matter what. But before we get into that, do you think we should cover off? Let's do conversations about bodily autonomy, but more in um, peer pressure and this kind of idea of fear of missing out and how to ensure that, you know, young people are equipped to have their own values and beliefs held true to them. Melissa, should we go to you? Sure. And as um, you were speaking earlier, Yumi, um, about <clears throat> yeah, about power, I I was probably surprised in several of the interviews that I did with young people for Welcome to Consent was the very detailed stories about how some of this pressure that was related to this kind of social power but also gendered, it was also gendered, I started happening in primary school, it started happening in sort of in late primary school and early high school when it became a thing to be paired up with somebody. And it was always girl and boy. Um, it was always very heterosexual. And it, nothing actually physically happened. You were just told you're now going out with him and she's going out with him and you can't choose. And according to, this was a handful of young people, now a bit older, but who, who were recollecting those early adolescent years, was that a lot of that was determined by the peer group and often by the sort of the cool group amongst the school. 
year. And they just felt completely unable to say no or to get themselves out of that situation. So I feel like these conversations about consent, when we fast forward a few years, and we're talking then perhaps about, you know, um, all sorts of, um, well, leading up to even criminal kind of activity, but but there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff we can do when they're much, much younger, which is about having those conversations about our bodily responses to feelings. And I think we spend a lot of time in the book trying to unpack how to understand those signals that our bodies give us. So before hopefully we get to, you know, freezing and fighting and, and um, playing dead or appeasing or fawning, starting to recognise what our body is telling us when we experience a range of emotions. And they can be very positive, joyful ones. What happens to our body when we're full of joy and euphoria, but also what happens when we're anxious, when we're a bit scared, when we just feel a little bit disgusted with something that's happened, recognising that, you know, our, our heart rate might go up, we might start sweating, um, we might start to feel nauseated. There's a whole lot of bodily reactions that actually happen. And and recognising those in any kind of situation is a really useful thing for children to learn, I think, and, and adults as well. And then once we're aware of those, we can give those feelings a name. We can start to understand when they arise and in what kinds of situations they arise. And then we can start to link those emotions or those feelings to thoughts and why we might be having those feelings. Um, and then going from there to understanding how the combination of feelings and thoughts leads us into behaviours, some of which are very productive and positive, and some of which, when we look back, we might go, well, actually, that wasn't so helpful. Um, so in the situation of, you know, these late primary school children who are being told you're going out with him or you have to kiss them at the party or whatever it might be, kind of just being aware of what that's doing to our, to our bodily reactions. Are we excited and kind of you know, looking forward to it or actually feeling a bit turned off and disgusted and maybe a little bit scared and just understanding those early signals, I think, and being able to have those conversations with an adult, preferably, um, preferably with a parent or a carer is, is a really useful place to start. And also um, I just want to add to that and maybe you may I'll throw to you to elaborate on it, but the idea as well of it's important to teach understanding about our own body and, you know, being empowered to say no and those sort of things, but also all of those reactions. Um, as you said before, you mean the way that consent can be understood from all these different ways and body language and tense, how to understand when the person we're interacting with, you know, the person we're being coupled up with in the playground, the person we're trying to kiss at a party, all those things, how they're reacting to that situation to ensure that, you know, the consent's enthusiastic. Um, would you like to elaborate on that or tell me your Tell us your thoughts on that, Yumi. Yeah, and I did also want to just jump in about peer pressure as well, Chanel, um, because um, it's such a it's such a trip to go through puberty. Uh, there's so many things that kind of kick in. It's like an awful space shuttle launch where you're quite unprepared. You're like they're putting kids in there, not astronauts. We don't know what's going on, and they're counting down from ten. Things like, okay, so all the body stuff we know about, the hormone stuff, the growth spurt stuff, but you also get a huge brain power boost. So suddenly, you know, you were thinking like a little kid and some, suddenly you've got more empathy and more understanding and you're processing things much quicker. Um, now, as well as that, there's also things that are common in puberty. This isn't, you know, a few people, this is everybody who goes through puberty wants to take more risks and it can be manifest in many different ways but you know you can imagine sexual risks or or social risks daring to ask somebody out can be one of those things and then caring more about your peers so that's where the peer pressure thing comes in um, at this particularly vulnerable time when you are in the space shuttle and you're taking off and you have no experience on how to pilot um, even a car let alone a rocket ship uh, but you but you've been given this responsibility so it's massive right um, and then the peer pressure thing is it's very easy to, to kind of misunderstand what that means I think people when they hear the words peer pressure they picture some hapless kid you know, ringed by friends and they're, and they're handing them a bottle of bourbon and saying, drink, 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 drink. And peer pressure doesn't actually really look like that very rarely anyway. Peer pressure is often more like, oh, they think I'm stupid or I want to be like her. You know, she's, she's got boobs and she's got a boyfriend and, you know, kind of allowing yourself to feel the judgment of others that probably 
doesn't necessarily exist, but it's writ so large in that adolescent brain when they're strapped into that rocket ship. You know, it's one of their primary concerns. A lot of it is made up, but it's also true that other kids do check in with their own friends and those peer groups and kind of measure their own growth by what their friends are doing. And, and they desperately want to keep up and they desperately want to appear to be cool. So that peer pressure can sometimes be the voice in their head saying, oh, you need to lose your virginity because three of your best friends have. So what, why are you the one hanging behind? You know, even if they're like, if they checked in with themselves, they might be like, well, I'm actually not even interested in that, you know? Um, so one of the things I think that Melissa was getting to just now was that idea about what do I want? Like, how, how do I check in and figure out what's my truth here? The, the, the key problem being that when you say 14 or 16, you don't even know, like, like what kind of sex do you like? I don't even know if I like kissing. What are you talking about? Like there's just, there's so much inexperience, but there's so much desire to get experience, but experience is what helps you make good decisions. So you're kind of blundering ahead quite unsure. So one of the things that we try to really emphasize in the book was actually, if you're not sure, that's a pretty adult response. Like we're not sure and we're adults, you know, we've gone through many experiences and still we kind of say, actually, do you know what? I need some thinking time before I make a decision on that. Um, kids in, in the heat of the moment, can be like, no, 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 I've got to, I'm, I'm saying yes, I mean, of course. And they also have this sense of scarcity, like no one's ever asked to kiss me before. If I say no this time, it could be another 14 years. <laughs> and I, can't, I can't be 28 and never be kissed. It is so embarrassing. So there's a sense that if I don't take this opportunity to do some sort of sexual adventure or intimate, intimacy adventure, the opportunity may never present itself. So the, those are kinds of elements to peer pressure that present themselves. And what we keep returning to is, uh, are you allowing yourself some thinking time? And have you got some words to say, actually, I just need to take a breath or I'm not sure what I want. Um, so I just need to think about it for a while and giving people permission to say that, giving people the actual words to, that they can practice, you know what, then they, you can start with low states, which is another thing that's really crucial with consent is, you know, if you're mm. teaching this to your kids or, or to your friends, um, do you want gravy on your chips? Um, I really want you to try gravy on, on your chips. <laughs> it's really great. Try it, try it. It's so awesome. So in that low state situation, the kid can go, do you really think I'd like it? It sounds kind of nasty. Um, and they're given permission to make a call, to have some thinking time if they need to. And then when their decision is made for that decision to be respected. A hundred percent. I think this idea of, yeah, exactly how you describe peer pressure sounding like makes kids think they're not experiencing it because they're not in that circle being forced to scald bourbon or whatever. Um, but from lots of conversations with, you know, usually boys my age who were obviously once young teenage boys, it's so, so, so common for a lot of people, a lot of boys to have their early sexual experiences the first time quite, you know, pressured and early and then not again for years because they feel as though they've ticked that box for their peers and they're not doing it for their actual body autonomy and their actual enjoyment. Um, they're doing it to satisfy, satisfy those around them so thank you so much for those specific situations on how you know peer pressure and puberty and adolescence all interact with each other to make those conversations a bit more difficult um I want to talk about something that um has it, it's it's on my mind a lot and I'm still I'm not entirely sure how to navigate it but different people have different interpretations and experiences and thoughts on consent depending on their own lived experience and their own cultural background and I was just wondering maybe if we could go into what are some examples of where a misunderstanding of this and not understanding people's different cultures and something like that something like that can lead to you know accidentally denying someone's consent or not being respectful in a situation and how to kind of navigate this as well when maybe they don't understand um our cultural position and that sort of thing so who, who wants to take that one away uh, I'll start but I'll let you Eve, um, elaborate I think we don't I mean yes uh, obviously um, meaning 
changes and means a lot of different things in different cultures, but applies to a whole lot of very fundamental human experience and, and things around health, particularly, and certainly around sex um, and consent. I think it intersects and cuts across gender as well. And I think that a lot of, there are still a lot of assumptions that we all have and young people have about the difference between males and females. There's still this belief that there's some quite marked difference in the brain, um, in the way emotions get expressed. There is there is really no biological basis for that presumption. It's I think we have to understand that um, these very stereotypical ideas about what it is to be ma a man and a woman or a girl and a boy <clears throat> uh, are very socially constructed, if I can be a little bit academic about it for a minute. Um, but that's really important when we try to unpack cultural differences. So, um, and again, we have to be really careful not to stereotype, but um, I grew up with uh, a, a Chinese, Malaysian Chinese father and an Anglo-Australian mother. There were very subtle differences in some ways between them, but, but others were really overt and obvious. And I think that um, if I look today at young people from a range, you know, from similar, I guess, cultural backgrounds to mine, so we say a, a Chinese young person versus a, a, an Anglo-Australian young person, I can see sometimes some of my own experiences reflected in, in there. So for example, um, and I think it talks to migrant experiences as well. So, you know, the pressure to have a really good education and to have a really good profession or occupation is a, is a reasonably common migrant um, cultural experience. But it, in my case, it was also very much a, um, a, a bit of an Asian thing, you know, for, for me when I was young growing up, this kind of pressure to do well academically. Um, and I think that for my father, that, that also intersected with gender in that, okay, you know, you're expected to go to university and have a good profession, um, but as a woman, you must also be very demure and pure and, um, you know, not dress, not dress inappropriately and all those sorts of messages. I think that those, um, I think that that was cultural, but it's not necessarily um, common across all people of my father's cultural background. I think what we have to do when we're trying to figure this out is say, well, what's the bottom line here? And for me, and I learned this at a very young age, the bottom line is that we have to treat all genders with equal respect. Everyone has the right to pleasure. Everyone has the right to have the kind of sex they want to have or not want to have. And there is no difference. There is no reason, there is no biological reason why um, men or boys have to have more sex or enjoy it more than girls and women. I think that has to be our starting place, whatever our cultural background. But of course, we'll, we'll see in different um, countries, different societies where those beliefs are very different. So we see legislation that forbids certain practices that's very gendered. Um, so I guess those are my overarching thoughts about culture. But I think it plays out in, in very nuanced ways, um, particularly in modern day Australian society where we have such diversity of culture and such diversity of um, beliefs and experiences that changes its, its generational, um, it's based on, on education and literacy and health literacy as well. It's based on um, whether you're from a small, tiny little country village versus a big metropolis, um, like one of the capital cities that we see lots, of, it, it, you know, it's, it varies depending on your, your sexual identity and your sexual attraction. So we see a lot of um, nuance in there that's quite hard to unpack. Over to you, Yumi. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Melissa. Um, somewhere where I think Melissa and I sh share um, a common background is having the Asian parent. Um, and I think it's definitely a, a, a cultural commonality that Asian kids do as they're told. Um, their parents tell them to do something and they do as they're told. South Asian, Indian, um, 
uh, and that I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, I think the boys, the sons are given a little more leeway to rebel or to ignore the instructions. Um, the girls are expected to completely comply. And I think that sets up the girls uh, to be compliant in their futures. And that's something to really think about and unpack. Um, another thing to talk about is um, disability uh, as kind of a, a version of culture. Um, and how that affects people's respect of consent around people with disabilities. Because uh, in our research, we found repeatedly um, people who have a visible physical disability have so much disrespect of their bodily autonomy. Um, a common example is if you're in public in a wheelchair, strangers think that they can come up to you and push you um, because they think they're being helpful. Um, but the, the, they would never do that to an able-bodied person, you know, go and escort them from A to B without a really clear conversation about that. Um, and similarly, people um, with vision impairment are sometimes grabbed and walked across, marched across roads they don't wish to cross or which they're perfectly able to cross by themselves. Um, so I think that's definitely something else to consider along with culture is, is certain uh, attributes that, that give other people so-called license to disrespect consent. That's a really, really interesting reflection. Um, the, yeah, the way that the intentions are probably good in that situation to think, oh, I help someone cross the road, but you're actually violating someone's personal space and not being fully empathetic about that. Um, yeah, I really resonated with everything you both just said because my parents are pretty old school Greek and it was the same kind of good Greek girl and do this and massive taboos around sexuality and virginity is so important and all of these things that ultimately kept me quite unsafe um, and meant that when something bad did happen to me when I was 13 and when I realised that what happened to me when I was 13 was illegal when I was 15 because that's when I got concern education, um, it was never an option to have these kind of conversations with them <clears throat> because these kind of open and frank conversations that we're having here today didn't really exist in my household in that way. So it's really um, special, I think, that this is kind of being modelled to um, everyone attending today, which is so great. I just want to remind everyone who's attending today that we do have a question and answer box. Um, so you have the amazing opportunity to ask these two very knowledgeable women anything you want, if you want to chuck that in the um, box below. Um, but yeah, I think on those reflections between um between like the kind of cultural and home life and stuff like that I think that links in quite nicely to this idea of teaching help seeking strategies to young people and kind of um that balance between setting rules but being like but also if you don't listen to these rules and something goes wrong we're still here for you and how to how to navigate that how to set up that environment um you may join to start on that and then we'll go to Melissa after I think a key thing with all of these conversations, Chanel, is that they don't, you don't just do the one talk and people often talk about, oh, uh, we got, we had the birds and bees talk when we, when I turned 12. Um, that is not one talk. This is an ongoing conversation that you need to keep regularly updating and consent is something that you can just weave in. It doesn't have to be math and it doesn't have to be, oh my God, she's doing the consent thing. It can just be like, did you notice how I asked for your consent um, around the, the, the roast chicken? <laughs> like it doesn't have to be just one where, where you're really excruciating sit down um, talk. So with keeping your kids safe and then allowing them to disclose something, um, allowing them to maybe call you in an emergency situation. Um, there's, there's, look, everything is gonna always depend on the circumstances. But I think um, I heard this amazing story from an educator about she was driving in the car and her little toddler daughter said, mommy, what's a vagina? And her face just, she kind of went, Ugh. And without meaning to, communicated to her toddler that this was something taboo and the word was bad, maybe the thing itself was bad and that they couldn't talk about it. Um, so I think from the outset, sort of having a, a certain chill about these conversations with the kids that, oh, something bad happened to your friend. So rather than going, ah, and, and then running away and screaming and, you know, creating havoc, I guess, in your own reaction to kind of going, okay, tell me more. 
are they okay? Do they need help? Do they have the right support in place? Um, so that they know if they happen to enter that situation, that mum is going to be chill and we're going to talk through solutions that suit me. Um, there's going to be consent around what I want to happen. Um, a key thing that I said to my teenagers was, look, anytime you want, I will pick you up. I will also pick you up um, and your friends. And I don't care if you are somewhere where you didn't tell me you were going to be because th that's completely fine. Um, and I and I reinforce that regularly. So give me a call if you need someone. Your phone's off lock, so oh, so your number's off lock. Anytime you call me, that you'll get through. And I don't drink, so I'll be sober night and day. I can jump in the car, come and get you. Um, and if they know and trust that, because it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to mean it. <laughs> and parents can be like all oh, the the rah rah and the I'm so good, but then when it's tested, they can be massive assholes. Um, and it's really really crucial to just be a parent and think: Am I being the grown up here? You know, am I being the support that they need, or am I kind of making this about you didn't follow the rules um, one thing that that Melissa and I can absolutely reassure you is prohibition doesn't work so if you say you mustn't drink ever it, there's just no you can't actually get a kid to adhere to that you know that they have to they have to opt into that if they want but you can't force them so if you put a rule down like if you drink you're in deep deep trouble um, and then something happens where they're drunk they're going to be scared to call you. Um, so you need to set up some, some realistic boundaries that you can get them to trust that you're going to be chill. 100%. I also want to add to that as, um, again, someone who's had kind of like lived experience with something bad happening and feeling as though, although, you know, I'm sure my parents, you know, my parents were devastated that I didn't tell them and all these sort of things, but that I didn't. But another thing I really noticed was how I saw them interact with media and stories about this topic and about other people. Um, you know, like, for example, when the Saxon Mullins Luke Lazarus um, case was all over the papers and stuff like that, the way they commented on that situation in front of me told me very clearly that that wasn't a safe place for me to go to when that situation was happening to me. And it's you know quite ironic because obviously if it was their daughter, they would have been mortified and done everything and taken him to court and blah, blah, blah. Um, but not thinking beyond that to think that, you know, this could very much happen, um, happen right in front of you. And yeah, keeping those safe spaces always um, on those sensitive topics. Dr. Melissa, anything to add to that before we go yeah, to some question? Yeah, look, thank you, Chanel. Thanks for um, being so open and honest too about your own, you know, your own story. I think we all really, um, yeah, appreciate that. It's, it's, it really helps, you know, us have this conversation, I think, flow in a really helpful way, hopefully for everybody who's listening. I think that um, a couple of things have, have come to my head while, while we've been having this conversation for the last hour or so is that, uh, almost an hour, is that, um, is that we've talked a lot about how we listen to our own body reactions and understand what we might be feeling and starting to develop some of that emotional awareness and cognitive awareness. Um, I guess the really important other side of consent is being able to understand that coming from another person. So obviously if we're seeking somebody's consent for something, we can't feel what their body's feeling. We can't think what those, we can't understand what those thoughts might be. So, you know, communication is obviously two way or multiple ways. And it's, it's just really important to, as we're teaching our children about understanding their own feelings and learning to communicate what they want and don't want. Also role modeling with them, how you listen and how you check in with the other person and observe their body language. So that's just one thing I wanted to say. Um, <clears throat> the other was about this whole, how do we keep our children safe? How do we have more than just one conversation with them about consent? And I think one thing that I've been asked or learned over the years talking to different parent groups um, is that on the whole, there's a lot of discomfort about just about sex. So when we become aware that our children, even the most progressive, you know, I like to think of myself as someone who was very open-minded from a, you know, from the, the day my children were 
born, um, that I would be very open and willing to have these kinds of conversations with them. There was still an awkwardness, you know, it's still kind of awkward when you see your children um, growing breasts and growing hips and growing facial hair and um, voices deepening and, and you see them interacting with peers, you see them you know, flutter their eyelids for the first time at, at, at someone at school or whatever. It's it's hard to know sometimes how to start um, talking to them about those feelings. So I think we need to, as parents, first of all, say, what's my comfort zone? What's my comfort zone with talking about sex? And how do I push myself further and further out of that and make that comfort zone bigger and bigger? Because that's really important. And you just gave a lovely example, Chanel, is about you got the message straight away from your parents just listening to them respond to an unrelated media story, unrelated to you at that time. Um, children will absorb those messages all the time from everywhere in the world around them and most particularly from their parents or carers. So we have to be really, really careful and thoughtful about how we communicate. I always say to parents, it's good to use kind of news stories or TV shows or streaming shows to have these awkward conversations because you can then do it in the third person. But um, we have to be careful then about, you know, listening to what our children, really being interested in how our children are responding to news stories and TV shows and sex scenes or whatever it might be. And, um, uh, you know, a young person I, I spoke to recently talked about how we just, parents often just, See, so there's so much violence, you know, so much violence on TV shows and in the news, and we don't we don't necessarily think too much about that, just sort of out there, and it happens. But when it comes to sex scenes, we kind of go all, you know, all quiet. Um, so those are my reflections on that. Is is about as parents and carers really needing to know ourselves first, and if we have really strong beliefs and values and attitudes about young people and their sexual activity um, and their sexual attractions, then we're allowed to have those, but we need to be, you know, really respectful that every individual will have their own sexual identity, their own sexuality, their own, you know, motivations and desires. Um, and just being able to process that, I think, is is really important and, and, and actually having those conversations with our children. So all the research shows that, in fact, the more parents talk openly and listen openly to their children about sex, the, the longer it is that their children wait to have sex. <laughs> and when they do have sex, the safer it is. This is talking about, you know, I guess, um, research done mostly in, in Western countries. Um, but certainly there's, you know, there's this fear that if we talk about it too early, that we're going to give them the idea. They're getting those ideas everywhere. They've grown up with sex all around them. It's all over the internet. Um, so if we start having those conversations with them, really when they're quite young, in an age-appropriate way, then um, it's actually much better for them in the long run. 100%. I just really quickly want to touch on something that you um, briefly touched on, but not explicitly the kind of idea of, you know, pornography becoming one of the main sex education forms for young people. Um, and also this idea of, you know, we constantly see violence portrayed in the media. Like you watch these crazy movies where cars are blowing up and blah, blah, blah. But we don't need to have conversations about the reality of life because that's constantly being modeled to children every day, every like all day, every day when they see their parents interact with people in the supermarket and driving cars normally and they're not blowing up and they're not crashing into each other. But the problem is with, you know, sex scenes that are often sensationalized in the media and then again, very, you know, explicitly so and often a derogatory and misogynistic way in pornography, we're not having that counter conversation to ensure that students and young people are knowing that that's um you know that's not real because obviously they're not gonna it's it's quite rare to see healthy intimacy um modeled in everyday life in that way so we do really need to actively have these conversations to ensure that we're countering that and being a part of that um so thank you both so much for such an amazing conversation we might have some time for a few more um topics between us but i just quickly want to remind everyone listening today that there are some resources in the chat if any of the um content today has brought up any sort of negative emotions or feelings for you um we have kids helpline 1-800-RESPECT full stop australia and men's referral service 
Um, so please have a look there and um, use those if necessary. So one of the first questions we have today, um, it's kind of for all three of us, but I'll um, send it to you two first. So how have the understanding of young boys and men developed in response to the research for the book? So, you know, engaging in these sort of conversations with young boys and men, what have you seen and learned over your three books together and lots of other things that you've done separately in your lives? We are also actually writing another book at the moment. So I've just been having lots of conversation, lots of conversations with young boys and young men, which have been so illuminating and, and really quite joyful, actually, Chanel. So it's not all bad news. Um, and, and the research with young boys and young men really is similar in that they are in an information vacuum. So when it comes to consent, there aren't that many resources um, where they can just kind of dig in and, and unpack it and, and find out what it means, which is one of the reasons why, you know, we felt like writing this was so crucial because you can deep dive without getting to the porn end of the internet, you know, like if, if you start Googling consent, I don't know what comes up, but I, with every Google search, porn is at the far end of it. Um, I, I, I also think that um, the work that you've done, Chanel, has been extremely useful and it, it has jumped the conversation forward in ways we couldn't have predicted when we were writing the book. Um, so, so that now consent isn't just a, a strange word that you talk about for one lesson in sex ed in year six, you know, like it's, it's actually something that I think is going to be actively threaded through curriculum, thanks to your work. It's freaking amazing that you have managed to have this impact that Dr. Melissa and I are like, yeah, yeah, yes. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. So I think young boys, they're just as hungry for this information as everybody else. They're, they're, they're greedy for it. They want things set out to be, and to be clear, like don't confuse us with maybes and gray areas. Make it really, really clear, set it out. A, a good example is alcohol. So, you know, because alcohol is such a thing in teenage parties, as you know, as your research showed. So what, what does that mean in terms of consent? How does it influence consent? So we can just actually be really, really clear and say, listen, and if they're really drunk, they can't give consent. They might be horny as. They might be saying, yes, 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 but just let's just draw a line and say maybe we won't do that tonight. If it's a great connection, we can whistle it in and exchange numbers and maybe make it happen when we're sober, but that is completely not appropriate when drunk. So you set that message to, to an adolescent, but I'm talking boys here especially, uh, and they love that. They love that clarity. 100%. Um, Melissa, do you want to comment on that as well? or should... Just really echoing what Yumi said, I interviewed, um, I mean, they were very poignant, some of the interviews around consent that I had with a couple of boys or young men, young adult men, which was, I wish, I wish we'd been taught this. Um, and these were, these were just young adults, you know, it wasn't that long ago, they said, I really needed this when I was in year eight because by the time I got to year nine, it was all about bravado and pretense and faking that you've done all this stuff. And, um, and they said, I really, you know, and, and then the same person also experienced a little bit of um, sexual harassment at work actually from another uh, male employee. And, you know, just, I really needed to learn this and there was just no way I was gonna get that in the environment in which I was schooled. He said it was, a, it was kind of almost a toxic culture. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think that, I, I don't know, I'd love to think that really your work, Chanel, um, has started conversations and that the book is a resource for people to continue having those conversations, be they young people themselves, be they parents and carers or school teachers, um, you know, educators, coaches, all the adults in the world who are caring for, for children and young people. 100% and um, that question also addressed the petition so I'll just answer quickly. Um, I know that I'm the facilitator but I'll put my two cents in. Um, so I've had lots of conversations with you know young men so boys my age in their 20s um, and some in their 30s and what's been remarkable to me is the amount of reflection they've done on their young years to also like be quite <clears throat> like acknowledge the problematic behaviors that they engaged in whether that be this kind of idea of peer pressure that meant that they called the girls horrible things or you know 
talked about things, made up things that they did with people, all of these sort of things that in different ways are um, disrespecting the girls around them. Um, but also the amount who have just explicitly acknowledged that they were like, oh my God, I didn't know what consent was. And because I didn't know I needed consent and because I was mimicking what I was learning and, you know, often pornography and things like that, um, I did things that I'm really not proud of. What do I do now? How do I fix this? And something I really want to emphasize is that, um, and that I hope the teacher's consent campaign drew attention to was that the vast majority of sexual violence and those times where consent is not, um, you know, not accepted or sorry, not the non-consent is not accepted is often occurs out of ignorance and accidental because these young people are experimenting with their sexualities and they haven't been equipped to do so safely um, rather than the fact that we have you know 6,700 teenage malicious rapists running around Sydney high schools like that's not the case at all um, so yeah these conversations I think have been really frank and I, I speak at schools quite a bit especially here in the UK that's how I earn my money here and um, speaking to young boys, they just, they, it, they die. I gave a talk the other day at a school in Birmingham to like about 200, seven and eight boys. I've never had so many questions in my life. Like there was about 200 people in the room and I think about 75 of them had their hands up, like jumping out of their seats. And then afterwards I was like, oh, just message me on Instagram, any of your questions. And the questions they were asking me were adorable. They were like, how do I compliment a girl without making her feel objectified? Um, you know, how do I do like how do you ask someone out how do you um ask to kiss someone how do you tell if someone wants is into you and it's like they're dying for this information so let's please give it to them um so yeah and it needs to be coming from parents and um all you know groups of parents as well so when the kids are speaking to each other about this stuff they're learning the kind of same things at home um I'm going to go on to the next question now so the next question is what examples of unfair advantage others have over you have you come across and how should you deal with it so I think this is a question basically explicitly asking um about that concept of power we spoke about earlier so what are the kind of classic situations where um power can come into play in these adolescents and teen years and where can it be um dangerous exactly yeah there, there are classics like the teacher student relationship is is one that that is drawn on constantly for for as far as a power imbalance goes if I say no will I get a bad mark on this essay and I'm not necessarily talking about sexual coercion or anything along those lines but it can be um another example that I saw in my real life was uh, a young girl I think she was um 19 and she had a crush on this um heavy metal musician who was American and touring here in Australia and went to the show and then ended up meeting him and going back to his hotel. So this is a real life example where she is completely up for it, right? This is something that she has chosen to do. But once she's alone in that room with that guy, there's a massive power imbalance. She's in his room. She's far from home. She probably doesn't have much money as a, as a 19 year old. And he's this guy who she's worshiped for years. So were he to put her on the spot and ask to do things that she really didn't feel comfortable to do. The question is like, does she have the power to say, Ooh, I don't really like that idea. Is there something else that we could do? So, so really in, in situations where um, the power imbalance is that great, I think that both parties need to weigh up the risks involved. 100%. I also want to, um, I want to call on Dr. Melissa to talk about this again, because you mentioned it earlier and it's something that resonated with me so heavily is I think with these ideas of power constantly thinking about like oh authority age money these very tangible things but what's become a lot less tangible is the power imbalances inherently between genders and like I know 120 percent that a boy who was the same age as me who had you know the same pocket money as me and whatever when I was in year seven eight nine and they were at the same year as me were just ultimately cooler and I ultimately strive for their approval and all those sort of things so do you want to maybe touch on those examples where gender can come into play in that yeah and I think I think it's it's about again um trying to explain and maybe even demonstrate to our children that you know the gender power imbalance is very real and they will know that well perhaps they won't consciously know that when they're that young something I think you I, I think I realised it when I was about almost 18 because I got these suddenly these very overt messages from both my parents, in fact, that 
that there were different expectations around dating and around sex that applied differently to me than my brother, my older brother. Um, but I think perhaps when they're still quite young, it's it's perhaps not so obvious when it's an experience that they're going through for the first time. I think what I hope will start to change is that it is that um, rather than having these more intellectual conversations about gender and power to younger adolescents and kind of late primary school age children is really about making sure that from now now on going forward that boys as much as girls learn about what consent actually means. I think that's got to be the main way forward at a, at a grassroots level. Um, of course, we can have, you know, talks in schools, we can have um, uh, school principals and teachers role modeling um, expectations and understandings around power and gender. But I think where it all starts, you know, in, in the classroom at home is really about making sure that we don't, like we're really conscious about how we speak to boys and girls and making sure that they're getting the same messages. I think we still do it unconsciously this idea that boys can get away with it a bit more, that it's normal for boys to, um, you know, make faces or crack jokes about the way a girl looks, but not the other way around. You know, those kinds of almost subliminal messages need to be brought out into be consciousness. Yeah, exactly. I think it's still really, really prevalent, really important. Um, if there's one thing mm. I would like to, to really mm. emphasise about that in, in this conversation, it's that we have vastly higher expectations of politeness mm -hmm. from little yes. girls yeah. than we do from little boys. Mm -hmm. And and as a parent, there's a huge power in reinforcing that with mothers expecting their daughters to be polite. Mm -hmm. And politeness is what can often get you in trouble um, mm -hmm. and, and make you override your own boundaries mm -hmm. because you don't want to risk being impolite. So my, my message is two words, please take these home, fuck politeness, fuck politeness. It's going it, to, it is so a disservice to young girls to be forced into this boundary of politeness that stitches them up and controls their behaviour. That if you throw away politeness, you're going to set yourself up to actually go, you know what? No, I don't like that. Or yuck, that makes me feel sick. Or there is no way that that thing is happening to me. If they're allowed and given permission from a really young age to say, actually, politeness is not one of my core values. <laughs> uh, I'm actually not really that interested in your feelings about my politeness. Then I think that's setting them up with some real, some real power for their futures. I could not agree more, 100%. That's probably also going to be what I should say. It should be the biggest takeaway. Like we constantly say, oh, no means no when we're talking about sex, but we never taught girls how to say no. So no wonder we're in this position. Um, yeah, amazing. So and this is quite a specific question, but um, probably one for Dolly Doctor as well. Um, my nearly 15-year-old is still actively grossed out by the opposite sex. Um, how quickly does this typically change? Like, is it nice, slow oblivion, and then suddenly falls through the head? Or is it more gradual? Will I see it coming? The answer to that is that all of the above and maybe none of the above. Um, look, there's a, there's a certain commonality and certain universality to puberty, and then there's also so much variation. So a 15 year old I mean you know it's it's completely normal for a any 15 year old to not be interested in um romantic or sexual attraction it it can be um related to biology but it can also just be part of, of they have other priorities and other interests and that may carry through into adulthood as well um you know any individual's sexual desire, um, sexual interest is extremely variable. It varies over our life course, but it also just varies um, from person to person. So I wouldn't be concerned. That's the first thing I would say. Um, will, it, will it suddenly happen overnight or will it happen more gradually? I think when it comes, if you're talking about sexual attraction and sexual desire, um, 
it it probably happens over at least a few months, like not overnight, um, because the duration of, of puberty, I mean, it all, you know, feeling horny starts to happen uh, close to the middle of puberty for um for, for boys and girls and th there are some differences in the, st the stages of development but it's around about the middle of, of puberty and puberty lasts anywhere from like four years up to seven or eight years sometimes so um, it kind of depends where they're up to um, but it, it might just be that you know it's just not going to be their their biggest priority in life um, I think you can get clues from having conversations about what's what's going on around them with their friends, with their friendship group. Um, I think, gosh, when I was 15, I was in a friendship group where none of us were even, we, we never thought anyone would look sideways at us and they didn't. <laughs> so it was not really a thing. My parents had nothing to worry about. And then it did start to pick up, thankfully, um, before I finished high school. But, you know, I, I think that... Um, I think that, yeah, it, it it's very variable at any stage from, you know, there are children who are very, uh, children have a sexuality, although it's not the same as once you've gone through puberty. So, you know, you can have a prepubertal child who's just very into, um, you know, playing romantic kinds of games. That's pretty common. Uh, that doesn't necessarily predict, though, that they're going to be these really horny adolescents and adults. So uh, I think yeah, it's probably something that I would expect to happen a little more gradually than just overnight, though. And, you know, you can just sort of start talking about it because there's plenty of it around, you know, at 15. There's plenty of examples, I guess, you can talk about and just try to, you know, to understand where they're at. I also just want to um, add to that, that on this idea that I touched on before about modelling behaviours around your children when it's things not related to them. Um, you know, ensuring as well that the safe space for children who may be of, you know, diverse sexualities, for example, to have conversations with parents about sex, because, um, you know, people who, like queer people are especially prone to um, sexual violence and not seeking help because of taboos around them and because of family stresses and stuff like that. So having these conversations in a way that isn't um, strictly heteronormative can be really um, a really good way to not only, you know, either potentially create a safe space for your child or then also a safe space for the world. Yeah, thanks for that, Chanel. And I, I, I teach medical students and uh, doctors who are in training to become GPs um, regularly and, um, you know, the kind of golden rule about bringing up the topic of sex and sexual attraction with young people who are our patients is very much around making no assumptions. So you can talk about feelings and attractions without making any reference to the gender um, of a person. And I think it, it's the same applies to parents really is kind of, you know, um, feeling attracted to someone or feeling, but not, not kind of saying, oh, don't you have, I don't have a boyfriend yet or a girlfriend yet is, is really important to be in, you know, to, I guess to have that door open to your child so that they will come to you. Um, yeah, and, and it is, you know, that the, the statistics on the mental health of gender diverse and sexuality diverse young people is still, uh, it's human right violation really, when you look at the data on the amount of violence and harassment, it, it's, um, it's completely unacceptable. And it, you know, it comes from that, um, often comes from, yeah, those very proximal environments like school um, where, where and, and online as well and, and in families sometimes where, where children who are um, not cisgender and not heterosexual do feel completely uh, unsafe and unable to um, express themselves and that impacts then on their mental health. 100%. Well, I think that's a great note to end on, the idea of inclusiveness and education and safety for all. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa. Thank you so much, Yumi. I've learned so much from you over my life and I continue to do so and I will continue to do so, I'm sure, for years.